Next on Arizona 360, conditions at a shelter in Tucson for migrant children. It was just a whole hall in every other room. A kid would be crying for their mom and you, there was nothing you could tell them. Plus, school resource officers teach others how to respond to an active shooter. I think there's a, there's a huge awakening as they walk out these doors. And what the results of Mexico's historic elections could mean for its ties with Arizona. I could say it's a victory of the people. Hello and welcome to Arizona 360. I'm Lorraine Rivera. Thank you so much for joining us. One deadline passed and another is weeks away for the Trump administration to reunite families separated as a result of the zero tolerance policy at the border. A federal judge ordered children five and under to be returned to their parents by July 10th. Remaining children must be reunited by July 26th. We still don't know how many of those children are being housed in Tucson at the Southwest Key facility. But this week, we're getting a better idea of life on the inside from Antar Davidson, a former employee at the shelter. You worked at Southwest Key or Estrella del Norte for four months. When you first started there, were there a significant number of children or did it just start in the last couple of no, months? No, there were about five. Um, however, over the last, uh, the last six weeks that I was there, that number skyrocketed and I was told reports from inside that it went up as high as 70. Arizona Public Media captured video of children in a courtyard at Southwest Key. A resident at the nearby Tucson house gave our crew permission to record from his balcony. We are blurring any images that give away the child's identity. The face of the population changed and you saw a stark increase in the amount of these young children who are under 12 and so some as old as five and six. So what's it like inside? I mean, this is a former hotel which eventually became college student living and now it's this facility. These kids are in rooms alone in the evening, for example? No, I, I, they probably wish very much that they would be alone. They're under constant supervision um, by a staff which is under trained, underpaid and under supported. So the situation itself became increasingly more hectic. We saw when you're a kid under 12 and it's bedtime, even the reg a regular kid is going to misbehave and be difficult. Um, now you imagine this kid doesn't know where their parents are. They don't know where they are per se. They don't know where they're, they don't know anything. And so they're expressing this trauma, particularly at night when it's time to go to bed. And so in the intake area where all they were, it was just a whole hall in every other room, a kid would be crying for their mom and you, there was nothing you could tell them. I had even spoken to case managers, they, they had nothing they could tell them. Kids are crying, kids are fighting and running around and this became something that was seen throughout the entire facility over the course of the rollout of the zero tolerance policy. Can you explain to me what, what it's like when a, a child arrives at the center? A lot of them have come from the desert. Some of them have walked, I've heard kids tell me as much as 28 days in the desert. So they're obviously like scared. They, they're being handed off from Border Patrol and ICE. So from there, it's a big difference. So we have to like say, they're, they're always saying like, this is not, we're not the police, we're not the government. This is a uh, shelter for you. You'll have food here. They bring them a meal. They do an, kind of an initial interview where they get their information. Um, then they do uh, vaccinations. They are having their physical needs met, but how quickly we forget that this country already has a very pro a big problem with mental health. It's not enough to be physically healthy. You also have to be mentally healthy. Yeah. So they need more than just physical necessities. Okay, so they have beds, they have a shower, they have clean laundry and toys, things like that, mm -hmm. and meals. Mm -hmm. There have been government officials, political leaders who have gone into these facilities and said, it appears they're well taken care of. You're saying they're not. We're talking about 27 facilities over four st states operating 24 hours a day. You're telling me that, that, that a person can come to a staged and prepared visit at one moment in time and declare the place safe? With all of these politicians and everything is paid for by tax dollars, they should work a little bit harder for us. Among the politicians visiting Southwest Key facilities, Congressman Raul Grijalva. He toured the shelter in Tucson late last week and told reporters what he saw inside. There's 297 kids. 79 of them are, are uh, the kids that are dealing with this uh, uh, family separation issue brought about by, uh, uh, by the Trump administration's zero tolerance. Uh, those 79 kids are integrated with the other kids. Uh, there is efforts to expedite their unification. Uh, I think, you know, the fact that uh, it's going to be difficult. It's clean, uh, but it's still a place that kids can't leave. The straw that broke the camel's back for you was when you observed children hugging or, or trying to ex express emotion toward one another? They, they were 
desperately trying to stay together. They were sep these were the three Brazilian siblings. They were separated from their mother the night before, and they were being told in Spanish and English, which they didn't speak, that they would be in separate rooms. Um, so when they understood that they were going to be separated from each other, the two younger siblings grasped onto, and it was m not just the hug, it was like, please don't take them away from me. They were not letting go uh, for obvious reasons. So they were like, Antar, come here and translate to them. There's a no touch policy, tell them that they can't hug. I had survived just teaching my class, my Capoeira class, teaching vocational courses in English and maintaining a positive uh, rapport with a lot of the students. If I realized that if I stayed, I wouldn't be able to do that any longer. They were enforcing more holds. They were enforcing just a very compassionless uh, policy with these kids and I didn't, I couldn't be a part of that. When you worked with these children, any of them express resentment or disappointment toward their parents because they felt that they were in this position because oh, of Oh no, oh no. People who say that I don't think have a very good picture of what it is they're escaping. Um, most of these people are fleeing for their lives. To your knowledge, did the children have an opportunity to communicate with their parents? According to the compliance agreement, which states the responsibilities of the facility, they have, they, they're required to have two, two calls a week. Um, to, so there's like a phone bank, there's a teach, uh, an employee that's dedicated to facilitating those calls. By the time I had left, they had all communicated, everyone had communicated. Thank you, Anton. Thank you very much for having me. It's a situation no one wants to find themselves in, face to face with a gunman. We got a look at how school resource officers in Pima County are training the public what to do if they encounter a shooter on campus. A warning, our story includes a sound of gunfire. At Sienega High School in Vail, a class of about three dozen is learning how to prepare for the very worst. Lessons learned today could save lives if they're ever confronted by an active shooter. It invigorates my sense of community to see uh, teachers and, and folks from around the county spending time out of their summers, some of them not being paid, uh, in dedication to their kids and to their communities. Taught by Pima County Sheriff deputies and first responders, Deputy Bill Farmer says about 600 people have gone through his department's active shooter workshop, now in its second year. And it's not just educators and school administrators, but members of churches and even the Pima County Attorney's Office. When we have folks who would rather uh, you know, put their head in the sand and pretend like something couldn't happen it only makes them more vulnerable and increases the, the risk of harm to the people that they have charge over. Ditch that gun so that you're not presenting a threat to us when we show up because we're going to be amped up as well. This does not happen without our kids, without the student role players uh, participating. I mean, you could have a bunch of cops try to dress up like kids, but it, it wouldn't be as effective. It's a big thing that a lot of people my age are really worried about, and I just really wanted to be involved in something that could really help save a lot of people's lives. So what we're doing today is we're now in the portion where you get to apply the things we learned about this morning, so you're now getting to put that into action, okay? In smaller groups, everyone goes through four scenarios involving guns, where they must make split-second decisions about how to keep students safe. One of the scenarios we're walking during a fire alarm outside. We're almost at the doors. A man with a rifle comes like right around the corner, like right in my face, like we're nose to nose to each other. Remember me! Remember me! End scenario. You see a teacher throws themselves at the gunman. That's a big deal. And that's a level of selflessness that I think not just cops, but anybody would be touched by. After each simulation, a deputy recaps their reactions and explains their options. That was the only choice I had. It was to grab the gun or get shot. Okay. But again, you guys did great. Just some things to consider. You'll never hear a fire alarm the same way, ever. If we're able to expose them to a little bit of stress, um, a little bit of that chaos in the training environment, then you will ultimately see a better reaction when, it's, when it happens in real life. Ask me 10 years ago if I thought I'd be doing an active shooting training uh, during my summer break and I would have said no. I, it's not just schools. I think that businesses and churches and everyone's preparing for emergencies. It's not just an educational concern. When your training involves real guns and real gunfire and real screams, it's different. And I think that it really stresses the fact that you've got to practice. 
I heard somebody say that you always sink to your lowest level of training. And we've only had um, some training, but we wanted to get better. And so we just wanted to be more prepared for these kind of situations and scenarios. Scott Billings has been in youth ministry for about 20 years and plans to share what he learns with the rest of his congregations. I think the biggest surprise, we had a scenario where uh, we were in a classroom and there was a shooter that didn't come into the classroom but was firing real shots. So we, we barricaded the door, we locked the door, we turned off the lights. But there was also a student that had left for a bathroom pass and she was trying to get back in. That was really tough because you have to decide, do we let this person in? Do we tell them to run? That was one of those things that really hit home for me. The biggest tool that we could provide people with is stress management uh, in uncommon circumstances. Uh, back in the Cold War era and shortly thereafter, we train kids in hiding underneath desks when the air raid sirens went off, but this is, this is our air raid siren. This is what's happening in our generation. At the end of the day, students and deputies prepare for the final demonstration. Oh my God. In a crowded hallway, workshop participants look on as students in makeup scream for help. as deputies move past them to stop a gunman. My job is to prepare my staff for the worst day of their life, to give them whatever training tools I can bring to the table. If I can't prevent this sort of thing from happening, then my job becomes to stop it. There's a huge awakening as they walk out these doors. Some of the feedback we're getting in our evaluations is that they wish that this was mandatory for all teachers and all school staff. Uh, I think that that is the goal. Uh, we would love to have FaceTime with all of those folks so we could give them a, at least a little piece of what we got. A difficult day designed to test emotions and equip participants with skills they hope they never have to use. Mexico's new president-elect promises profound change for his country. How change could impact the United States, though, remains to be seen. Andres Manuel López Obrador's presidential win is part of a broader power shift in Mexico. His left-wing Morena party also won majorities in Mexico's Senate and lower house, unseating the long-ruling institutional revolutionary party, also known as PRI. To better understand how these victories will play out, we turn to Roberto Cepeda, a visiting scholar from the National University of Mexico with expertise in U.S.-Mexico relations. Basically, Andres Manuel uh, López Obrador is the leader of this party. I would say it's like a, a, a left-wing party, but not uh, very radical, more to the center, right? He's supporting free trade policies. He is supporting also a, a democratic uh, institutions. I don't see a radical change with, uh, with the uh, policies of this uh, party. He's not new to politics. This is, as a matter of fact, his third run for presidency. Why did he get elected this time? Yeah, probably the difference now is that people in Mexico is fed up of uh, corruption and violence. We have the highest levels of violence uh, in terms of uh, homicides, for example, and this probably uh, affected, right? Another factor is that crea he created, López Obrador, coalitions with uh, members of the PRI, of the PAN, and, and, and he created a wide coalition with unions also. Uh, with different sectors, with a, a, a new uh, party, uh, which was, which is also more like an evangelical uh, party. Mm -hmm. And then probably this coalition uh, was successful in his victory. Mr. Lopez Obrador has been very bold about how he feels about cartels, corrupt politicians. In the same breath, he's declining security. This is potentially a dangerous area for him to be treading into. Yes, I agree with you, Lorraine. I think uh, he should reconsider this decision. Uh, his advisors uh, are suggesting uh, he needs protection, right? Because we have to consider that during the course of the campaign, there were 130 murders. 
uh, most of them uh, local uh, candidate for, for local candidates for local positions. Does he do this because he believes he has some level of respect with the cartels or is it because he, he's tired of seeing the same cycle repeat itself and he wants to change? Yeah, actually he's trying to change the, the political uh, situation in Mexico, uh, but uh, uh, one of the things that he's proposing is like a amnesty for criminals, for, uh, well, I would say for uh, people in the, uh, like in, uh, they were forced to work, right, for the drug cartels, right? Mm -hmm. And he, and he's also uh, uh, trying to uh, ask the people or to call for for the people to protect him. He, he has extended an olive branch to President Trump and it appears their relationship is on a firm footing moving forward before he's inaugurated in December. That's a good signal. Yes, and then also uh, the, uh, I would say that during the campaign, President Trump, uh, I didn't see any, any that he criticized Lopez Obrador. And then uh, he was one of the first uh, presidents who congratulated him by, uh, in a tweet, yeah. right? Then they had a very long telephone conversation on Monday. Uh, uh, of, of course, uh, it's, it's very early to say, uh, but I think this is uh, a, a good beginning. Lopez Obrador, the president-elect of Mexico, he says he wants to war with Trump with the United States to, uh, to create uh, economic development, not only in Mexico, but also in Central America, in order to create uh, jobs and in that way to uh, reduce the migration flows to the United States. Arizona and Mexico share a very rich, strong trading, importing, exporting business. The hope is that it continues. Is that possible under this leadership? I think so. I think so. And uh, Lopez Obrador, as I said before, uh, his agenda includes uh, NAFTA, right? He don't, he don't want to withdraw from NAFTA. And also, he is open to, to new positions from the United States, to new proposals like this bilateral trade agreements. And, and I, I, I don't see a major change in the economic relations between Mexico in the United States during, uh, because of this political transition. Closer to Arizona and Sonora, Mexico, voters there also push Morena candidates to victory in what is historically a conservative state. Murphy Woodhouse covers trade between Arizona and Sonora for KJZZ in Phoenix. He joins us now from Hermosillo. Murphy, good to see you. Nice to chat. Tell me how significant it, the election of Manuel Lopez Obrador is in a place like Sonora, which is traditionally conservative. The quite sweeping victory seen nationally for AMLO, uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, and uh, his coalition and party Morena uh, was uh, was mirrored here in Sonora, uh, and in fact, in some ways, was uh, was was even uh, uh, more more convincing uh, nationwide. Uh, he got a little over 53 percent of the vote, uh, but here in Sonora, according to the final. Uh, uh, the final tallies uh, from the National Election Office, uh, just shy of 60 percent. And again, just to put that in perspective, that, that's not just him against one other candidate. Uh, that, that's him against uh, two other candidates representing mainstream parties, uh, as well as a, a fourth uh, independent candidate. So uh, just a, a, a quite wide margin. Any skepticism about his ability to actually do the things he said he would while he was on the campaign? Uh, he certainly made a lot of, uh, uh, you know, very, uh, very strong uh, promises. Uh, you know, uh, uh, among among the many things that he has proposed is increasing the minimum wage, doubling pensions for elderly Mexicans, um, and uh, uh, at least during some of the debates that I watched, um, he he puts a lot of hope in. Uh, being able to pay for a lot of those uh, efforts by reducing uh, the corruption that he and, and many Mexicans see as, as quite endemic and widespread uh, in, uh, in, in the country. But of course, there are those who uh, are skeptical that that would be enough to carry out what is undoubtedly a, a very ambitious uh, agenda. All right, Murphy, there's some conversation from AMLO about his, his policies or his proposals for the border. 
during the campaign, uh, uh, AMLO did propose a number of changes uh, for the border region uh, with the idea of improving the economic situation there and also very, uh, very explicitly uh, trying to make it easier for Mexican nationals uh, to, to make a life for themselves and their families in Mexico without having to resort uh, to migration. Uh, among them is uh, you know, significantly cutting some of the taxes in the border area and also significantly reducing some of the customs, uh, in, uh, I guess not enforcement, but certainly making it easier uh, for, for goods to go back and forth, uh, again with the idea being to really promote uh, economic development. Uh, in that in that part of the country, and that could certainly, if if uh, those ideas do come to fruition, could certainly have major impacts on on the Arizona Sonora relationship. Uh, he's also talked about uh, measures to increase the minimum wage and salaries uh, in 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 the border region as well, which would obviously have uh, a number of impacts. For the next three years, Sonora will continue to have a very conservative governor. How likely is it the Morena Party can actually gain any traction during that time under Governor Pavlovich's leadership? The remainder of her term, uh, uh, Morena will have uh, a lot of power uh, in, in the legislature, and the state high-ranking Morena officials that we've spoken to, or specifically my colleague Kendall Bluss has spoken to, they made the point uh, that you know we, we seek a, a respectful uh, a, a relationship of mutual respect with the governor's office, but also uh, you know we are, we are going to insist on uh, a balance of powers. Governor Pavlovich, Governor Ducey have a very strong relationship here, Arizona, Sonora, they've dubbed it the mega region. How likely is it that that can continue despite the presidential shift that we've seen and then also with the elephant in the room of NAFTA renegotiations taking place? So the, the Marina officials that we've spoken to have said nothing but uh, that, that it is their desire to, to continue uh, the very strong relationship between uh, Arizona uh, and Sonora. Uh, and then, as you, as you mentioned, at the, at, the, at the national level, with ongoing NAFTA renegotiations, AMLO has signaled that you know, he intends to be a meaningful participant in those negotiations. Uh, I believe he will have a representative uh, during those negotiations, but there is this kind of uh, lengthy interim period between the election and when he'll actually take the presidency. He will not take the presidency until late, uh, late this year, so obviously a lot of things can occur uh, between now and then as far as NAFTA re renegotiations. Uh, but again, all, all the signals that we're getting from Morena officials is that uh, uh, they want nothing but a, a continued strong relationship and positive relationship between uh, both Arizona and Sonora and uh, Mexico uh, and, and, uh, and the United States more broadly. Okay, Murphy Woodhouse from KJZZ. He is in Hermosillo. Thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. After the 2016 election, Homeland Security claimed Arizona's election system was hacked, though it's unclear by whom. As we get closer to the primary and midterm elections, Christopher Conover tells us the state is making sure that won't happen again. It's not uncommon to get over 50,000 uh, unwarranted attempts or intrusions a month. You heard that correctly. The Secretary of State's office houses the Division of Elections, and someone tries to hack the computers there an average of 50,000 times a month. And it's not just that office. As a state, we get attacked about eight and a half million times a month. While both of these figures may seem staggering, they are average compared to state governments around the country. Arizonans first became acutely aware of the hacking possibilities in 2016 when the FBI revealed Arizona's election database was attacked. The state's cybersecurity team says that report may have been missing some context. I don't want to say, you know, there were people lying or fabricating or anything like that. But in my opinion, uh, it was, a, in, at least in the state of Arizona, it was... Uh, exaggerated a little more than I would have liked to seen it. So what happens is we always get attacks against systems. There's always people trying to get in. Uh, there's people coming in from all over the world. So what they're trying to do, we don't know. They may be just trying to do their normal thing of stealing data and make money. And um, though they may be a targeting system, could I sit here and say nobody in this world is interested in changing our elections? No. I'm sure there's many people that are trying to do that. So how is the state keeping hackers out of its database? First of all, your vote is not online. The machines that count ballots in each precinct are not connected to the Internet. The only way to hack them would be to take the data cards out of the machines, and there are thousands in the state. Ballots are also paper, 
so they can always be recounted. Now our voter information is stored on the voter rolls and security for those is a different story. They are online, which means a hacker could potentially change a voter's identity information. That's one of the nightmare scenarios for election officials. So you go to the polls someday and you're not Chris and you don't live on the street that you live on. Um, if you really wanted to mess up an election, that'd be the way to do it. That's why election officials have built safeguards for everyone who has access to that database. We instituted something called multi-factor. Um, it's a way to authenticate that a person using our database is authorized to do it. So it's not just using a password. Um, you'd also have a, something like a key tag or something that's sitting around your desk where the computer has to read that and the password. That makes it harder to hack into. And probably the biggest thing that we learned was those, uh, if, you, if there's a, 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 a bar that you're supposed to enter information in, let's say it's asking for your name. It shouldn't accept any other characters except for letters. That keeps someone from entering programming code instead of names into the database, a common way hackers plant programs to steal data. Even if the voter rolls were altered, someone who believes they should be eligible to vote can always cast a provisional ballot. Then they can prove they're eligible and their ballot will be counted. Officials are doing more though. Earlier this year, Governor Ducey created the Arizona Cyber Security Team. Its job is to outsmart the hackers. This keeps the team busy, but they can't talk about how they do it. We tried to put together a, a bunch of steps and a layered approach to security to protect our data. So remember, when you ask that question, the question's personal because it's also my data. It's my family's data. It's my friend's data. So that's what I'm protecting. The Hollywood image of the hacker is a single person sitting in a dark room. Sure, those rogues exist, but they aren't the only threats. It also could be as complex as that same guy has control of a thousand computers around the world, and he can have all thousand at once uh, launch some sort of attack against a single entity or multiple entities. Arizona's team is in constant contact with federal cybersecurity officials to make sure they know the latest threats and methods which can change daily, sometimes more often. The bad guys only need to be right once, and our systems need to be right every time. And that's all for now. Thanks for joining us. To find out what we're working on, visit us on social media and let us know what you think. We'll see you next week.